Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated and welcome to the Joe Isaac Symposium. It's wonderful you're all able to be here with us this evening. Uh, former colleagues and former students and many friends of Joe's and in particular uh, Joe's three children. You don't look like children anymore, but uh, <laughs> and, and, and some of your children, <laughs> Joe's, Joe's, Joe's grandchildren are here. Uh, so thank you very much for coming. And normally in the front row, at nearly all of these symposia, there's been Joe and usually Gold are sitting right in the front as well, participating and contributing. And it's sad that they're no longer able to do so. But when we first, when Julian and I first sat down over a cup of coffee with Joe more than 10 years ago and said we were interested in starting something like this, he said, oh, you can't do that. And we said, why not? He said, because you don't do that till after I'm dead, uh, if, if, if at all. And we had to meet him two or three times to convince him that it would be good to do it while he's still alive and he can enjoy it. And he said, well, there's one condition. So he said, what's that? And he said that Monash and Melbourne collaborate and do this jointly together uh, as, a, as a team. So we've done that for the last decade and had a lot of fun and had some interesting discussions as part of that. So without further ado, apart from reminding you to switch these off, I'd like to request that my boss, uh, the, the Dean, uh, comes to the stage, Professor Simon Wilkie. And Simon is a distinguished economist who's joined Monash only earlier this year, who's come back to Australia, having been the chief economist at Microsoft in, in the US and before that at uh, the Bell Labs and the University of Southern California and Caltech and, uh, and various other distinguished roles. So please join with me in welcoming Simon Wood. Thanks, Thanks Simon. <clears throat> Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathered today and pay our respects to their elders, both past, present and those emerging, and extend that respect to any other Indigenous Australians present. It's a great pleasure to introduce this symposium uh, in honour of the late Emeritus Professor Joe Isaac. Um, and as Greg pointed out, as usual, even from beyond the grave, he helped plan it. Um, so welcome to you all, especially members of the family. Uh, we offer our sympathies uh, to his family and friends for their loss on September 17th. Uh, his three children and several of his grandchildren are here today. And later on, his son uh, Graham will speak later. So uh, there are several excellent obituaries, uh, which I'd like to recommend to you. Uh, some of them composed by people in the room, uh, Greg, Emeritus Professor uh, Russell Lansbury, Emeritus Professor Ian McDonald, uh, and I'm sure over drinks you can probably get them to elaborate on um, some of the content and what was left out. Um, uh, in brief, and most relevant to this conference, as we know, um, Joe established Monash as an Institute of Excellence in Industrial Relations. Uh, we're proud to continue this tradition and continue building on his legacy. Uh, the fields of IR weave together different areas of management, labor economics, labor law, and human resources, and so weave a uh, depth of interaction across many of the disciplines that are in our business school today. Uh, some of these are re really quite exciting at the moment as the nature of AI and how big data is being used is changing the structure of organizations. So I want to mention apologies from somebody else. Uh, so as we all know, Professor Margaret Gardner, the Vice Chancellor um, of this August institution, also works in the field of uh, uh, industrial relations and also uh, was at Cornell for a brief period of time, like our esteemed speaker. So uh, she sends her best wishes. Unfortunately, um, she can't be here tonight uh, because she's actually hosting um, tomorrow and the dinner tonight, uh, a meeting of the GO8 uh, on how we uh, organize our strategy on thoughts around pushing uh, 
um, Australian universities are being the forefront of AI. Um, so she's uh, uh, unfortunately double booked on that one. Um, but her PhD uh, uh, supervisor is President Pro uh, Professor Emeritus Malcolm River. Um, uh, Joe helped uh, appoint him as the founding head of the Australian Research Council National Key Centre in IR at Monash, uh, which is a forerunner to our uh, I crew, uh, now headed by Greg, uh, the International Consortium for Research in uh, Employment at Work, uh, which is part of our uh, Centre for Global Business, uh, which is headed by Fang, who's out there somewhere. Uh, <laughs> and so... Um, as Margaret put it um, uh, in her uh, previous speech uh, about Joe, which, by the way, you can watch on YouTube if you're so inclined, um, uh, when introducing one of the earlier symp symposiums, Joe was a legendary academic who brought rigor and understanding and analysis of the fields of IR, synthesis and judgment to provide policy solutions, particularly in the fields of wages and income policy and labor market issues. He was able to seamlessly move from the world of academia into the world of practice. Uh, that is high praise coming from Margaret and is in fact an extremely rare and valuable skill set to people who can make that transition. And I think at this point in time, uh, we need more of such people. Um, so as uh, Greg mentioned, these events are jointly organized by Monash and Melbourne University. That was Joe's preference since his long and distinguished career spanned both institutions. Uh, they're the two leading institutions in this field, this field in this part of the world. And after being at both universities, he managed to return to both of them. <laughs> so in my field economics, we would call that playing a mixed strategy uh, quite effectively. Uh, and so uh, beyond his academic work and beyond, as I said, taking academic work and applying it to the real world, he was also a man of great public service. I just want to point out um, some of those roles uh, briefly here. Uh, Joe was deputy pe president of the for forerunner uh, to the Fair Work Commission. Uh, and he held extremely important leadership positions, including being president of the uh, uh, Australian Academy of Social Sciences, I've got here President of the Economic Society, and the IR Society. Uh, it's pleasing that pe good people are here from each of these organizations to acknowledge Joe's legacy in building these institutions in Australia. So welcome to everybody else who, uh, from a wide section of academia, from unions, from industry, from government, uh, former mem uh, members of the legal profession, consultants, and any of a special welcoming to any of Joe's other students who are out there. Uh, finally, I would like to mention Joe's contribution to philanthropy and the funding of PhD students uh, that's made possible at both our institutions. Uh, we greatly respect um, and acknowledge that uh, generosity. So thank you all finally for attending. Um, we look forward to a great evening and uh, I'm now going to hand it over to the main attraction. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Simon. I'm not the main attraction, and I'm going to hand it over to the main attraction, who is Professor Harry Katz, who holds a named chair at Cornell University in the ILR School of Cornell. He's also director of the Scheiman Institute on Conflict Resolution at the ILR, that's the Industrial and Labor Relations School at Cornell University, which is probably the biggest and the best in the world, in our field. At least that's what you told me before we came into this room, uh, Harry. Uh, he's also been the provost at Cornell University uh, after having been dean at the ILR school. And among his many other accomplishments, he's the incoming president of the International Labor and Employment Relations Association, which is the umbrella organization in the IR field that the IR Society of Victoria, which Simon mentioned Joe had been president of, uh, belongs to. So enough rabbiting on, on my part. Harry, please come and take over uh, the microphone and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Great. 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 Sit down. Um, thanks, Greg. Um, it's an honor uh, to be here. I want to thank both Monash University and Melbourne University and all those involved at those universities for this invitation. Um, I uh, unfortunately never met Professor Isaac. I was looking forward to the lunch we were supposed to have. I was amazed to learn that he was still active and always liked to meet with the speakers. So in preparation uh, for uh, that lunch, I read up about him. Uh, I read some of his articles. I read some of those uh, uh, summaries of his career, one written by Russell Lansbury and Chris Wright. He clearly uh, had a remarkable uh, career. Um, I actually was uh, struck by how much his career uh, epitomized what I've tried to do in my own career and what I've encouraged my own students to do. I want to just mention two facets of his uh, career that I so much have emulated. Um, one's been mentioned that, that he combined academics. He was a great academic and a sound academic, but also he was an incredibly active in the public policy sphere. And just as the dean said, we need more of that. I've tried to do that myself, and I encourage my students to try and play that role. Um, there's another thing I want to mention about Joe Isaac's uh, work, and that's his intellectual perspective. And here again, uh, I find an incredible similarity in his perspective and the perspective I've pursued in my own academic work. And that is that, on the one hand, he was a really uh, well-trained economist, that he thought economic factors and forces were critical uh, uh, in the shaping of modern society, and one had to have a good understanding and grounding in economics. Uh, but at the same time, uh, his writings and his public policy work were driven by a perspective that recognized that institutional factors also mattered, institutional factors uh, being things like the law, the history, the culture, the politics. Um, and what his work epitomized, again, which I have so much emulated in my own work, is a recognition that uh, seeing that both economics and institutional factors matter uh, didn't mean that you thought it was a compromise, that it was kind of half economics and half institutions, that what Professor Isaac's work showed is that because of the interaction of economics and institutions, we have outcomes that are not described by either of those alone. That essentially there was a unique interplay of institutions and economics. And again, it's exactly what uh, I've tried to do in my own research and I've encouraged my own uh, students to do. So in some ways, I, I feel like I'm a soulmate. <laughs> of Professor Isaac, and I can't help but mention there's another little twist to being a soulmate is I learned we have the same birth date, March 11th. <laughs> Who would have guessed? Okay, so let me then turn to the subject I've chosen to talk about. It's one I've been uh, studying um, in the recent period. Mo most of my career I've been a student of collective bargaining, uh, trying to understand how collective bargaining has evolved, particularly over the post-World War II period, uh, particularly in the United States, and I've occasionally uh, tried to analyze how collective bargaining has operated in other countries as well and compared other countries to the US. What I've been struck by most recently is that there are a variety of new organizations uh, spreading I'll refer in particular to the United States because that's what I know best. But as you'll see, I see these kinds of organizations spreading in many countries. They're organizations who are trying to improve the work conditions and working life of employees. Uh, and they're doing so through collective actions. But those collective actions do not involve collective bargaining. Um, let me first tell you how I started looking at that phenomenon. Uh, and then come back to how uh, I've observed it in the United States, and then I'll speculate a bit about um, where it might be going uh, and how it might influence events here in Australia as well as elsewhere. Uh, 
So I, I got started looking more closely at all these collective actors that are operating outside of collective bargaining. When I was working on a book with two colleagues, Tom Koken and Alex Colvin, that's entitled Labor Relations in a Globalizing World. We, we set out to look at how labor matters, labor issues, work conditions were being set in particular in what we call transition economies. And then four economies we focused on in that book are China, India, uh, South Africa, and Brazil. And in writing that book, I, I, I learned that there are a variety of organizations. They often are characterized as NGOs, non-government organizations, various forms of rights groups, worker rights, immigrant rights, women's rights, street sweepers' rights, domestic workers' rights. These NGOs and whatever you want to call them, rights groups, collective entities, in those transition economies are more important than unions. They're having a greater influence now, uh, influencing, sh shaping, trying to improve working conditions for working people in those four countries, and from what I can tell in many other transition economies. Uh, then I started updating my own textbook that I also now co-author with Tom Koken and Alex about US collective bargaining, and it led me to the fact that I had to more closely examine the counterpart to those kinds of organizations in the United States. And I've been struck by the fact that one can make the same uh, point, that those kinds of rights groups are now in many ways more important in the United States than our unions. Um, just a few to mention. There's a wonderful organization called the Amokali Coalition, improving the work conditions, working life of the people who pick the tomatoes in Florida and other parts of, of the country in the US. There's an enormous array of worker and immigrant right groups operating in the US, some through what are called worker centers. Um, there's also what you might refer to as affinity groups appearing in non-union firms in the United States. You may have read in the newspaper about employees collectively going on protest at Google. Uh, uh, some of that protest involved the issue of sexual harassment. They were, they were upset that one of the executives at Google was leaving Google under the suspicion of having committed inappropriate action and was given a large severance uh, payment. There's also a f uh, uh, affinity groups at Google protesting about the treatment of uh, lower tier employees, uh, people who are not regular status workers at Google. You may also have read about an affinity group at Uber. We're all talking about Uber as the plat epitome of the platform economy. In the United States, there's been active uh, groups of drivers in various cities and states joining together, uh, trying to improve work conditions. Here's a little interesting uh, tale about that. It's an issue I'll come back to. Um, so there was an effort underway to create a dispute resolution procedure within Uber uh, being asked for by this affinity group and the company was uh, uh, debating and discussing the possibility of how to shape that complaint procedure in part because obviously it wasn't just to do good, they were being embarrassed in the press by uh, issues surrounding how easily and often mistakenly drivers were dismissed by a complaint or one or two passengers without true merit to that. Well anyway, here's a little tidbit, um, there was a, a, there's a union, the International Association of Machinists, which decided it was going to support that affinity group, particularly in New York City, where it's New York, everybody's kind of generally angry about something, and they joined together. If you've walked on the street, you can see this all the time. Uh, they, they joined together more readily than they might in other places, and so this group was meeting with Uber executives. And the machinists were uh, deliberating uh, as well as what they would find and advise this affinity group to accept as, as, a, as a reasonable uh, complaint procedure. Again, the, the IAM, the machinists were eager, and still are, because they continue to be uh, aligned with this affinity group, hoping that this group might transition into a union. Okay, here's a little insight. So the people that were providing assistance to this, I won't name them, but they're the ones who told me this tale, uh, they were told to stop their activity. Uh, who were they told by? By the AFL-CIO. 
the AFL uh, concluded this, this, was, this was bad, uh, this was not a real union, this was a form of, in their language, a company union, and they advised the, 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 those assisting the, 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 the IM and the affinity group to, to stop. And in fact, the IM and the affinity group proceeded, but I find it telling, and I'll come back to that issue, that the formal labor movement was, was uh, contorted or twisted by this, this, uh, this issue. Uh, there's also been other forms of collective action outside of collective bargaining uh, that have risen to the scene in the United States involving uh, public school teachers. Again, you may have read uh, a year ago so in, in, in states, uh, some of which in the United States, unionism varies enormously in the United States by state. In states where you don't have strong unions among public school teachers like West Virginia, Oklahoma, and all, teachers were essentially conducting wildcat action, forming affinity groups, some successfully going to legislatures trying to get more money for the schools, better pay for school teachers. Again, I find it uh, uh, revealing uh, that uh, even in a sector where there uh, are unions active, public school teachers in New York are fully unionized in California, in Illinois, there's currently a strike going on in Chicago led by a teacher's union, but uh, where those uh, unions are, are not so active, and even in some states where the unions uh, were there and present, th there was action occurring outside of collective bargaining uh, where employees were joining together uh, trying to use collective action to improve their working life. So it's made me think a bit about sort of how to uh, assess these actions, kind of what are the criteria one should use when, when uh, analyzing, observing, and maybe even forecasting the future of these sort of collective actions. So here's my criteria. One, uh, the degree to which employees exert an independent influence and voice via representation. representation. And in other words, the degree to which representation is free from managerial dominance, right? We, in industrial relations, know when has to seriously worry about whether a channel of communication is really being manipulated by management. Second criteria, the breadth and depth of the issues addressed by the representation process. In the United States, there's also been you know, political action. The fight for 15, the fight for a $15 an hour wage is an important uh, action occurring with the support of unions in the US. But I think of that as advocacy. It doesn't have the quite depth and breadth of, of a representation process, and you'd want to distinguish it. It's important, important advocacy, but I'd want to distinguish that from a collective representation of this other sort. A third criteria related to the first, the extent to which the leaders of a representation effort are democratically elected. Uh, to what extent are there free, is there free choice by the employees themselves about their leaders? And then perhaps most importantly, a fourth criteria. Uh, the staying power of representation obviously will be heavily influenced by the degree to which there is institutionalization, where, th where there is structure to the representation process. In collective bargaining, we always look at collective bargaining agreements, right? Procedures that are written down, that are more concrete than just a promise uh, or a pledge. Um, and in particular, what you'd want to know related to those kinds of structures is the degree to which there's a substantial financial basis uh, for that representation activity to continue and to blossom. Uh, to, to some extent, that's like the clock striking 13 for many of these efforts. Like, how are they going to last? You know, how is an affinity group at Google going to really make a difference? Um, how is in a complaint procedure supported by affinity group with action by that affinity group at Uber going to have a lasting impact if there's no financial basis against the strength of collective bargaining, particularly the strength of US style collective bargaining is there's very strong financial support, financial underpinning uh, to, to those processes and procedures and all. Um, needless to say, this a central question that underlies uh, these representation processes is the degree to which they serve as a complement or a substitute for collective bargaining. I want to return to the issue I raised about 
the AFL and its concern for that affinity group at Uber. They're not crazy for worrying about the possibility that that activity is substituting for bargaining, in some sense is preventing sort of a, a more significant, a more lasting, a, a, a more powerful form of employee voice for emerging. But they may be wrong, right? It, it may be the opposite. It may be that affinity groups transform or transition, not in all cases, but in some cases, to more formal processes. Now in the United States, uh, let me remind you that in the public sector in the United States, before there were unions, there were employee associations representing those public sector employees. I'm speaking about the police, the firefighters, even the teachers. They formed associations, they formed affinity groups. This is well documented, some nice research by Richard Freeman and Casey Ichniowski. There were affinity groups, representation groups, that essentially helped the employees both see the power of collective action and to some extent help them transition into activities that involved more formal collective bargaining and ultimately in the public sector, as is the case in Australia and many other countries, um, public sector unionism has flourished with a start, with a kickstart from associations, another form of affinity groups. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about Australia. I, I was last here in 1995 and 96, thanks to help from Russell Lansbury and Greg Mamber. I was traipsing around uh, uh, looking at changes underway at the workplace in Australia. I was trying to understand at that time how enterprise bargaining, as it was called here in Australia, compared and contrasted to what was happening in the United States. In the United States, we always had some localized bargaining, uh, fairly decentralized bargaining, and I was curious about whether Australia was kind of, uh, how it compared and contrasted the United States. I won't go into all of that, but in any case, all it does is say to you, I kind of was up on Australian developments thanks to Russell and Greg's help as of 1996. <laughs> and since then, I, you know, I read the newspaper, I, I read articles, but I'm not an expert. But I am impressed by the following, right? In some ways, Australia similarly, like has occurred in the United States, like exists in many of those transition economies, has, be, has now has very, very weak unionism and collective bargaining, and certainly in the private sector, right? And in fact, lots of research is showing that what's happened in Australia, you know this better than I, is, is the spread of individualization, the, 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 even the spread of, of agreements that are in non-union firms. You know, your Fair Work Commission and others are, 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 are mechanisms in some ways to, to respond to the spread and even to some extent to promote individualization and alternatives to collective bargaining. Um, I recently was looking at a nice article by Mark Bray and Joanna McNeil in the very nice Journal of Industrial Relations that's produced by the University of Sydney. And they document the fact that even in recent years, though the percentage of the workforce is represented by unions has plateaued in Australia, that the coverage of collective bargaining has continued to decline substantially in Australia. So the preconditions are there for Australia to follow the same route as has occurred in the United States and in these transition economies. And what I, what I can't tell you, because I'm not an expert in Australia, is whether if you look closely, you find the same affinity groups. You know, or at least you find counterparts to, the, to those affinity groups, or at least you find the start of affinity group activity uh, of the sort that I've been documenting in the United States and also observing in those transition economies. Um, so now the question I'm, I'm left with, and again, I, this one, I'm an academic, so all I have is really good questions, not necessarily great conclusions is um, twofold. One is, why is this happening? <laughs> why is this happening? Uh, I kind of look sharply at my dear friend Mike Piori, because he's the sort of person that I think can probably better answer this than I. Mike has looked at sort of social and identity groups and their role in modern society. And I'm curious, and I don't have a good explanation myself, that perhaps the spread of affinity groups <laughs> 
is is a, is, a, is linked to is a part of the uh, fragmentation of identities and the creation of strong uh, identity groups ac across uh, a population. Uh, maybe that's what's propelling it, right? An alternative view is the one I was kind of alluding to. I'm a student of collective bargaining, and I return to this. It, it's, it's the representation gap. It's the weakening of unions that creates the space, that creates the need for some form of voice and representation. It's not being met by collective bargaining, and we in industrial relations all know it's our core belief. I bet Joe Isaac would have shouted this out if he had the chance. There's conflict all over the place, right? It's not just unions that create conflict. Conflict exists because labor and management at times have, have opposing interests. It's, 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 it's natural for there to be conflict. If it's natural for there to be conflict, there's natural for employees to want forms of representation. And the other key point of industrial relations, it's not surprising that expressions of voice take the form of collective actions. Employees are not satisfied by individual action. Appropriately so, they understand they don't have much power and influence acting as individuals. They gain power when they act as collectives, right? So maybe it's the gap, maybe it's the decline of unionism that lies behind the growth of these affinity groups. And maybe, like in many things, it's a combination of factors. Maybe there's something happening within society that leads to identity formation, fragmentation, and the need for affinity groups that are, that are different than the earlier forms of collective association. And these forms of collective action are filling that need combined with the weaknesses within unionism and collective bargaining. And then last but not least, of course, the question is kind of what's going to happen. You know, is it likely that the affinity groups, are we at the sort of the tip of the iceberg? Affinity groups are, are going to solidify, not all of them, but some of them, and that we'll see kind of more institutionalized forms emerged or more structured forms of action, right? At this point, uh, I, I could certainly understand why some would, 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 would sort of poo-poo what I, what I've said. Oh, you know, okay, Google employees go marching around for 24 hours or, you know, taxi drivers want some form of complaint procedure. Yeah, that's meaningful, but it's not the, the same um, uh, impact that unions had or could have uh, and, and all. Um, I'm reminded of the fact that in the United States, at least, as of the late 1920s, there wasn't a single academic that was predicting that unionism was on the brink of exploding into growth and there would be wildcat strikes and sit-down strikes and a massive explosion in unionism uh, and all. Uh, that tempers my uh, efforts to try and predict what will happen and so I'll just leave you with those questions. Why is it happening and what will it all amount to? Um, thanks again for this opportunity to share these remarks with you. Well, thank you very much, Harry. Uh, don't go away uh, just yet because we've got time to have, to, some, to have some discussion. And just for the benefit of those who haven't studied US industrial relations, you referred to the AFL-CIO uh, as not supporting the affinity group in relation to Uber. The AFL-CIO is the equivalent of the ACTU, the Australian Council of Trade Unions. It's a kind of central organization in, in the US, which I guess saw that affinity group as being not a genuine union and as possibly undermining their position and, 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 and so forth. And so what I'm going to suggest is that we might have a few questions, two or three questions, and then invite Harry to keep a note of some of these points that have been made and for you to give a response to some questions, Harry, if that's okay. So I can see a former student of Joe Isaacs uh, sitting, Jeff McGill. So if we can get a microphone to Jeff, please, and... And do use the microphone because we are recording this this evening. And uh, another question is coming up. So another microphone over here, please, to start us off. And uh, first of all, Jeff, go ahead. And let's keep the 
questions yeah. brief, so we've got chance for a few. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, Joe, you referred to Joe's um, emphasis on both economic and institutional factors and the interaction of those bringing or creating quite unique uh, outcomes. And, and talked about the development of affinity, group, affinity groups in the United States and start, pose a question of what might happen in Australia. Now, the institutional arrangements, of course, are very different. And the capacity for individuals and groups of individuals to uh, have a voice through uh, those institu institutional arrangements, Fair Work Australia, uh, will have a very significant impact on whether there is the same need for uh, affinity groups emerging in Australia. You might want to comment on that. Thanks, Jeff. Are you happy to hold that question, Harry? And we've got an. And who else is, would like to join in the discussion, just so we can get a microphone in the right direction? Um, but please go ahead and, and remind us your name. Oh, my name's Linda Rubenstein. Um, I'm a friend of the Isaac family, I guess. Um, but um, I'm interested to know whether you've considered the role of social media. Um, whether for unions or for affinity groups. And just for information, there always have been, you know, migrant worker groups, working women's centres, these sorts of things in Australia that have had some influence, but um, it would appear from what you said, not on the scale um, of what seems to have happened in the US. Thanks, Linda. Anyone else at the moment? Ian, I can see, if we can get a microphone to Ian, who is among the people here who who has written an obit of Joe Isaac, which is available at the, at, in the age online and probably can appear in print any day now in any the age in Sydney morning. Every day with thing. eagerness. And Thanks, Ian. Yeah. Yeah. But it is online. Okay, the question I wondered about was the role of ideology in this. It seems since 1980-ish, there's been a, quite a shift in ideologies, the word I'm using, to sort of a more right-wing individualistic philosophy which is also presumably an anti-union philosophy and I wondered how this uh, if you could say anything about how this might relate to the growth of these affinity groups okay well thank you Harry would you like to sure. respond unless there's any other immediate yeah. question at the moment go ahead <laughs> great Simon. Yeah, great questions thank you um, the first one was about the role of Fair Work Australia, and you know I, I think you're exactly right. I, 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 as best I understand it, in some ways you could say that there's at least a potential channel through which employees outside of collective bargaining, or at least outside of union collective bargaining in Australia, have the potential for voice, or at least there's an entity that potentially is going to influence and structure in a way that doesn't exist in the United States. And I, I absolutely agree that, that to some extent, you know, the, 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 what will, what, the, the role of affinity groups in Australia will depend in part about what happens in these various forms of non-union. For U.S. people, it's almost hard to even say. Non-union collective agreements and in individualization, individual contracts. Again, that doesn't quite compute in the United States, but I gather it sort of computes here. Uh, and you're exactly right. It, uh, you know, we'll have to watch that closely to see whether that fills the need or maybe does the opposite, spurs, inspires uh, kind of a, a, a more structured affinity groups and a search for, for more collective action, stronger collective action than you might otherwise have. The question is social media, another good point. Yes, clearly the availability of social media makes it possible for affinity groups to operate in a way that didn't exist or at least was more difficult in the absence of affinity groups and the absence of social media, I meant to say. And, and you're, you're, you're right that, that, that it helps. It, 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 it only helps, though, to a degree, right? Even with social media, you still need institutionalization for the, that group action to become more forceful and sustainable. But you're right, it certainly facilitates affinity group action, no doubt about it. So maybe that's a piece of why 
we see these actions uh, uh, now versus 20 years ago. The role of ideology and in particular, uh, that's right, there's a very strong uh, uh, conservative uh, bias in the United States, the rise of managerial authority and finance capital that's very strongly anti-union in its philosophy and actions, it, it certainly has contributed. I'm one of those who's actually downplayed the role that those forces have played as compared to other factors such as management, uh, very aggressive non-union human resource management. But anyway, what I'll get at is that ideology is very strong and it's important. So again, what is that? Does that mean that affinity group action, collective action, will will be blocked? Will will be repressed? Or, or maybe it's going to again be the opposite. Maybe it's gasoline on the fire. You know, maybe you, you reach a point. In, in, in various workplaces where people have just had enough, you know, or, or fed up with the lack of other forms of representation, and that spurs them into these, these new type of actions. That certainly is, is a way to describe the kind of wildcat actions among the school teachers in West Virginia. They, it, they just got fed up. They, 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 they couldn't take it anymore. And it wasn't just, it wasn't, as you probably know, it wasn't about primarily about pay, though that was thrown in the mixture it was they don't have money for books, the buildings are falling apart, they're unsafe, they don't have supplies. And, and so maybe the, you know, the, the right kind of overplays its hand and induces a, 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 a stronger uh, rebellion uh, and, 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 and counteraction, maybe. I, I'm always dampening the hopes of my more radical friends who think the revolution is right around the corner, but <laughs> But I don't know, yeah, it's not a revolution per se, but it is collective action. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that may you know, happen. And to some extent, you see within the Democratic Party, who would have guessed the Democratic Party, uh, or parts of the, Dem the candidates now would come out for you know, Medicare for all, and the, the labor movement is kind of hopelessly dreaming about the possibility of somehow the federal government in the United States spurring industry-wide collective bargaining. You know, we're gonna become like Germany overnight, it's kind of a crazy idea, but who would have ever thought there were Democrats? You know, it was, it, was, it was always, I think, kind of telling that even liberal Democrats never said things that were so forcefully pro-union, and now they do. And so maybe there's gonna be a counteraction uh, induced by the, the very forceful uh, right-wing uh, ideology that's, that's um, always repressing uh, collective action and unionism, and, and I'll, anyway, I'll stop at that. There's time for a couple more questions, and there's one. Please introduce yourself. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Professor Katz. Uh, my name's Frank Papper. I'm a Gemba student here at Monash. And you've mentioned the USA, Australia, and the BRICS countries. There's one country that has very little union um, activity or strikes. And that country has one tenth of the level that its neighbour France has. And you mentioned it, Germany. Yeah. Germany, by law, requires that union representatives be voting members of the right. board. Right. Do you think that's a solution and how likely or unlikely do you think that maybe? And maybe we just take the last yeah. question, Harry, and then let you respond. Um, and just give a microphone to the, the ju Justice Jeff Judice at the back, please, because uh, I know he likes to have the last word. But before he comes in, uh, Russell, Russell Lansbury uh, here and then Jeff and then Harry might wrap up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, for Harry. Uh, as you would know, one of the issues that Joe Isaac was very concerned about in his last paper was uh, low wage growth, uh, and he ascribed that partly to uh, decline of unionisation, but also the, the loss of the strength and, and importance of the uh, the tribunal, the yeah. Fair Work Commission. How much of an issue has this been in the United States, and how, to what degree, has this been something that affinity groups have addressed, and how effectively have they done so? And uh, lastly, Jeff is the yeah. former president of the Fair Work Commission. Harry, just for your uh, background information, hmm. please, Jeff. Hmm. Yes, thanks, Greg. Uh, after that build up, I hope that this question isn't too facile. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, the, the interesting thing about the, uh, these groups is that the, uh, 
they are forms of collective representation. And um, uh, uh, my question is, what is it in the institutional arrangements or other arrangements which have led people to go to these groups yeah. rather than to unions? Yeah. Harry. And, uh, and I noticed while you were making comments about teachers protesting in the US, there's at least a couple of people here from the government education department and they were kind of shaking their heads saying, this could never happen here. I think that, that's what I interpreted there. They, they were Bless you. expressions. Yeah. Okay, the first question is about Germany. I mean, you know, in my dreams, I wish we, 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 we would have a, uh, the possibility of of works councils in the United States and co-determination, but but I, I think we're, we're quite far from it. When I was giving a version of these remarks uh, uh, last June, I, I said the following. I just left it out because I wasn't quite sure how far I wanted to go into sort of bemoaning the state of affairs in the United States. I said, we used to dream that the United States would move to become more like Germany. What's actually happening is the United States is looking more and more like a third world country. Uh, it looks more like the transition economies that, that have very weak unions. If the unions exist at all, they exist in the public sector and maybe among a few multinationals. Uh, and uh, we're, 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 we're going that way <laughs> more than we're going towards Germany. Um, it is amazing to me that the AFL-CIO has come out in favor of industry-wide sectoral bargaining. Uh, uh, yeah, dream on, you know, the United States is going to have sectoral bargaining. Um, okay. Um, it's the next two questions were, I think, somewhat related. Russell asked, it, you know, the low wage growth and whether that was the focal point. And then the um, related question about what were these groups actually pushing for. Um, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that it, it is not primarily about wages. Uh, you know, we have this fight for 15 going on. Again, I think kind of interesting. I would have never, I didn't guess, you know, if you asked me 10 years ago that we were going to have kind of a strong press for a $15 minimum wage, federal minimum wage in the United States is $7.35, not $15, yet we've had a, several states, we're a very federalist system, so several states, cities have passed, as you probably have read, $15 an hour uh, wages or movements to that. Um, but that's not what these affinity groups are focused on. They're, they're more focused on due process, about voice. I think that's very telling, right? It's, it's about voice. The other tale I tell about voice is, look at the, the issue of, 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 of sexual harassment in the United States, right? The Me Too movement. What that's all about, I mean, in addition to some shameful behavior, uh, mostly by men in power positions, is the lack of due process, complaint procedures, voice in organizations. And that seems to underlie a lot of the collective actions. Um, concerns about voice, about due process, um, and through other mechanisms, though low wage and inequality is an incredibly important issue and sad development in the United States. Uh, again, I, th I think it's telling that a lot of these collective actions are about voice due process. Uh, and I, t I, I, I interpret that to be a reflection of the fact that, yeah, non-union HR has become more sophisticated, but they still haven't figured out how to provide meaningful voice to employees, and employees have realized that and know that, and they're seeking a uh, uh, more effective voice. Thank you, Harry. Just stay where you are, and we're grateful Harry's uh, here with us this evening in spite of having had surgery just, uh, just before getting on the long-haul flight to come here. So just stay sitting down, Harry. And as we've mentioned, this is a joint symposium always between the two universities and uh, to symbolize the joint venture. Uh, here is Dr. Ju Son from Melbourne University who's going to wrap up for us. Please, Ju. Mm. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for coming here. I am Ju Yeon Son. I'm a senior lecturer at the Department of Management Marketing at the University of Melbourne. And I'm very honored to do this vote of thanks today. Um, before I express our gratitude to Professor Harry Cutts, 
for the insights he has shared with us today. I would like to acknowledge the late Emeritus Professor Joe Isaac, in whose name the symposium is held every year. And also would like to thank everyone who helped put this event together, as well as all of you here today who have decided to be part of the symposium. And we turn to Professor Harry Cotts. Thanks for the insightful look into the complex issues around new forms of work, worker representation. Uh, based on his exper expertise on new structures for labor man management relationships in the United States, and specifically on labor relations uh, in the automobile and telecommunications industries, both in the US and other countries, I uh, deeply appreciate him for sharing your thoughts on the changing workforce representation today with us. Um, especially in this sharing and gig economy, the points that Professor Cotts made regarding new form of employment re uh, representation, such as NGOs and change in the roles of traditional unions, it's happening and these points also resonate strongly in many countries, not only in the US, but also in Australia and many other countries. So to follow this train, trend, I thought that we can also think about how these changes um, in industrial relations affect other areas of research. So as a HR OB scholar, for example, the new form of representation of gig economy workers by union or NGO could affect multinational corporations such as Uber to change their HR policies to respond to such pressure and improve their company image. Or for organizational behavior or psychological perspective, looking at how such representation of NGO and union could improve job satisfaction or psychological well-being of these gig economy workers uh, and how eventually this affects or change their performance would be an interesting topic to study. So even though this event is framed as an um, industrial relations symposium, and although this is my first time actually participating in this symposium, I've been told by my colleagues that the Joe Isaac Symposium is all about the exchange of ideas from people from this different backgrounds. Um, thus, I strongly encourage you to think about how the insightful thoughts shared by Professor Kotz today uh, could play out in your own area. Okay. And whichever discipline you are from or whichever um, career status uh, in your academic career or if you're not academic, if you're a practitioner, this symposium could be a great opportunity to meet other people and share or start some meaningful discussions. So on that note, refreshments and drinks are waiting for you outside already. So please enjoy. And now I will conclude by asking you all to join in a round of applause to show our thanks to Professor Harry Cutts, to everyone who supported this event, and to all who came today. Thank you. And Graham Isaac, one of Joe's sons, is at this point, typically Joe stands up and he uh, gives a little critique and makes a few comments about what's gone on during the uh, proceedings, but Graham's going to play that role this evening. Thank you. Please welcome Graham. Thanks. Thank you. And, and, and those of you who don't know Graham, he's a, a film producer. And, 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 and one of the films I really enjoyed of yours is Brand New Day. I should have him on the payroll this <laughs> okay. Look, I'm not going to try and stand in for my father. I couldn't possibly. But I would like to also join others in thanking Harry Katz for his, uh, his very interesting address today. And I wish my father had been able to engage with it because he would have responded not just to the intellectual content but to the humanitarian impulses in the work. Um, and really... Uh, the one thing that I really wanted to say and to speak on behalf of my brother and sister and some grandchildren who are here and some other relatives to really uh, thank uh, Joe's colleagues and ex-students who've been enormously supportive to us in the last month and it's made us realise that he stuck it out with work for so long, not just because of his intellectual drive and endless curiosity, but because of his passion for people. And uh, 
there's plenty of people here who are going to miss him just as much as we do. And the, the warm tributes that you've given have really been quite overwhelming and they've been very uh, helpful to us. And also, as you know, and it's been mentioned, that he's got, had this very deep attachment and gratitude both to Melbourne and Monash and this desire to give back. And all of these interests are really embodied in this event that bears his name. And the three of us will certainly be adding our support to make sure that it continues well into the future. So thanks for supporting this event and thanks for the support you've given to us in the last month and let's all go and have a drink. Yeah.